This episode of Let's Find Out with co-host Diego is brought to you by the Snarly Yao, located at the Needful Things Emporium in Charlestown, West Virginia. The Snarly Yao, located at the Needful Things Emporium in downtown Charlestown, West Virginia. T-shirts, artwork, cryptid books, the Snarly Yao has it, Snarly Coffee, Snarly Prince, Snarly Beard Care, the Snarly Yao has it, cryptid spice rubs, cryptid soaps, cryptid candles, the Snarly Yao has it, the Snarly Yao is located at the Needful Things Emporium, 218 West Washington Street, Charlestown, West Virginia. For all your cryptid needs, remember, the Snarly Yao has it. Make sure to tell them co-host Diego sent you. Are you curious about the unknown? the unexplainable. Do you find yourself intrigued by the mysterious and paranormal side of our world? Join us on an adventure into the world of inexplicable discoveries and investigations that may someday give us the final answer as to what may be behind the veil of reality. The borders of space and time have opened once again and transmitting from the mountains of West Virginia it's time once again for Let's Find Out with Diego. The universe is waiting for you. <laughs> the borders of space and time have opened once again and transmitting from the mountains of West Virginia. It's another episode of Let's Find Out with Diego. Thank you for taking this journey with me on this episode of Let's Find Out. Our guest has always held a deep fascination with the paranormal, dating back to the 1970s, where his interest was influenced by the then popular television show Dark Shadows and reading the works of Edgar Allan Poe, a published author with two books under his belt and a series of short horror stories featured in three anthologies. Our guest also has a YouTube channel where he shares his paranormal investigations. All this plus more. Please welcome to Let's Find Out, paranormal horror author and YouTube creator of Asa Swift's Haunted Places. Asa Swift, Mr. Swift, my friend, welcome to Let's Find Out. It's a pleasure having you on. Well, thank you, Diego, for having me on. appreciate it. Of course, my friend. You know, I've been watching some of your YouTube channels. Very interesting stuff. Not only is it paranormal, but it's got a lot of historical qualities to it um there's so much to talk about my friend but let's start with this this you know i didn't mention this during the introduction but we talked about it briefly uh before, in the pre-interview about your close to 37 years as a law enforcement officer i mentioned this because that career could keep you very busy very demanding at that time do you ever think that you'd start another career as a horror author and on a second part of that question, during that time as an officer, did you get to see anything unusual in relation to the paranormal? Well, the first answer short is no. And the second is yes, I did. Uh, the first answer to elaborate on that is um, uh, I know I never. The, I always had that monologue going in my head whenever I would see a horror movie or or hear somebody talk about. Uh, an experience, and I would, I would always say to myself, "Oh, I, I would have, I would have done it this way, or I would have said this, or instead of making this happen, I would have made that happen." And, but it never occurred to me that that I could actually do that, take participate in that uh, creation of my own. And um, <clears throat> I spent since since probably. Uh, I was 17 years old, 16, 17 years old. I decided that I wanted to be a police officer. And uh, so I pursued that. I was a sheriff's explorer back in the late 70s. I then went to a special deputy school and was a special deputy for off and on uh, several years, about, well, about seven years total here and there. Um, I took a different type of job in order to go through the Indianapolis uh, Police Department's uh, Reserve Academy. I graduated from that in 1990, and uh, I stayed with the Indianapolis Police Department, slash now called the Indianapolis Metro Police Department, until 2020, October of 20, 
2020, where, where, which I uh, actually retired after 30 years, believe it or not, as, as a reserve uh, police officer. And uh, I got a gold badge with the chief, picture with the chief and, and all that stuff. Uh, and at that time, I was also uh, as, uh, working as a special deputy sheriff for a, a hospital security campus <clears throat> or a hospital police department. But um, I've had medical problems and stuff that had been interfered with my ability to to continue in that line of work, and and so I retired uh, just last year, about April. As far as the second one goes, um, while I was a police officer, there were there were two incidents while I was a police officer. The first one was um, this was I think. The first one happened when we, when we were still called the Indianapolis Police Department. And the second one happened when we became the Indianapolis Metropolitan Police Department. But the first one occurred while I was working. It was a, I was just working day, day shift downtown, uh, patrolling the beat, uh, which is what reserve officers here do. They just they do regular police work, robberies and everything. Um, and that's what I was doing that day. And I had to stop by the uh, roll call, which at that time was on uh, uh, West 9th Street downtown. And um, I had to use the restroom. And so I stopped in the roll call. Uh, this is after, after, way after roll call. And uh, parked my uh, patrol car uh, towards uh, Illinois Street, which is one way north. Behind me was Meridian Street, which is north and south. Came back out to the my patrol car, got in, was going to go back downtown, backed into an alley <clears throat> between police roll call and another building, and I saw a blonde woman with shoulder length straight blonde hair. She had on a a pink uh, dress that later on I uh, I thought was strange, but at the time. I was just kind of, um, I don't know, uh, my attention was drawn to her. She was very attractive. Uh, she had, but she had these white wrist length gloves on, little like cloth gloves. And she had a little, little purse tucked under her arm. And the, the dress was very light pink and it was down to around her knees. And she was walking smack dab in the middle of the alley, probably about 10 feet behind my police car. And so I'm backing in and into this alley and then to turn, go back the other way towards Meridian Street downtown, farther downtown. And uh, as I'm back in the alley, I see her in the middle of the alley. This is in broad daylight, uh, not 10 feet from my car. We locked eyes and I was going to say, don't worry, I, I didn't miss you <laughs> because she, she was she was very attractive. and. Uh, by the time from my eyes shifted from the mirror, by the time I turned my head and looked around, she was gone. I, I stopped my police car in the middle of the street and jumped out thinking that, you know, what, what the hell? This, this can't happen. I, you know, I've never even heard of this. And I looked for a, I, I tried to debunk it immediately. I tried to find a, a billboard. Did I, did I? I lose my mind and I saw a poster or something. There was nothing and there was no doors. And it would be it would have been humanly impossible for somebody to be gone in less than one second. Uh, I had no way to explain it. Later on, after I finally got over the shock of seeing this person that I thought was a living person. I mean, I can describe her. Down to to the clothes she was wearing. Uh, the look on her face was just an ever slight smile. She was in a good mood. Let's just say that. She was in a good mood. And um, I then realized later on that women don't dress like that anymore. And when they did dress like that, it was when I was a boy. And uh, back in the 60s and 70s. And uh, and when they dress like that, it's because they're going to or from church. The little gloves, 
wrist length, a little purse, the light uh, summer pink dress billowing out, you know, it's right, right on her knees. And uh, the, the, uh, the hairdo kind of uh, uh, threw me off a little bit. It wasn't done or anything. It was just straight blonde down to her, uh, to her shoulders. And uh, I realized, I remembered uh, that morning as I was coming into roll call, still dark when we get there, uh, 5.30 in the morning. And uh, as I'm going down the alley to pull into roll call, I noticed that the the back of this church there was there's a church there at uh, at uh, St Clair and Meridian Street. Everybody here knows what it is uh, what I'm talking about. And uh, there used to be an addition to that church, and they made it look per, uh, like like the the main part of the church. Well, they were tearing down that addition that back half, and you could even see where it's separated. But the the outer uh, brickwork or or stonework, or whatever, looked just like the rest of the church, but you could tell they were a separate building. And uh, <clears throat> you could see workmen's lights inside there uh, gutting the place. I could see uh, the work lights hanging from uh, steel I-beams inside there where they had literally gutted the whole thing. And I, I got to think, and I didn't think anything of it at the time because I was just you know going to work. And uh, I got to realizing that's the back half of that church that they're tearing down. And she looked like she was coming from church. And so that's the only thing that I could tie it to. That's the only way I could explain it. Because as I said, as soon as it happened, I, I literally jumped out of the, the car and tried to debunk it myself and could not. Up until then, my, I guess you would say, assumption, without ever actually speaking it, was that ghosts don't appear outside in broad daylight and look like real people. Ghosts happen in abandoned, darkened buildings, whether it's a house or a factory or whatever, or an old hospital. They happened into a, in abandoned buildings. And uh, and and only at night, and only inside, and that blew away everything that I ever just assumed was was the case. And, and prior to you have this encounter with I'll call the ghost lady in broad daylight during your patrol, did you have any type of paranormal experiences growing up? The only one that I can the only thing I can remember is that I, I lived in a. Back in the late 60s, early 70s, we lived in a house uh, from Hartford in Hartford City, Indiana, which is no longer there. And at that time, I think the house was like 75 years old. It was it was in bad shape, but it was like 75 years old. And I noticed sometimes the lights would work in there and sometimes they wouldn't. I just always got, you know, that was upstairs and I always it gave me the creeps. So I don't know if there was anything to that. You know, it's, it's just 75 years old. Maybe it's bad wiring. I don't know. We never had any shorts. We never had any fires or anything. But I just noticed that sometimes I would turn on the light and nothing would happen. Other times I would turn it on, it would come on just just fine. Um, but other than that, no, not when I was a kid. And uh, the only other one I had, again, when I was, was on duty, um, it was for the Indianapolis 500 uh, parade before the before the race, and I was stationed at uh, where was that? It was in Michigan, Michigan and Meridian, and which was my, usually my post that I was assigned to for the 500 parade, and had to go to the bathroom again. <laughs> yeah. uh, and, and that's my thing, you know. <laughs> so I'm I I go into the war memorial there, which is a fantastic, I've also done a, a video on that too. So if you want to see that, look that up, uh, the Indiana, Indiana war memorial, a fantastic place to go inside. Talk about creepy. Uh, they've got their own ghost stories there with all those weapons in there that were used, you know, how many, how many people they kill, you know, it's lots of them. Uh, and they're the real thing. Um, but anyway, I was going there to use, use the bathroom uh, real quick. 
and um, parades going on. So there's no, there's no urgent reason for me to be there nonstop. And uh, so I go in, use the bathroom, and uh, and then I turn around uh, and go to the to the uh, sink and uh, to wash my hands. And the, these are brand new faucets. They had just replaced the old brass and washer, you know, type uh, faucets in there with modern cartridge type faucets that look like old ones. Um, and I, I just happened to notice that because I would go in there a lot uh, on uh, on all of these details that were downtown. And um, so I'm washing my hands. I go over to the next other wall by the exit and I turn on the blower and it's one of those really high powered ones. It makes a lot of noise. And I'm standing there drying my hands, and all of a sudden I hear this other noise start. And I hear it uh, like a, a shh, like that. I turn around, and that faucet is back on full blast. I don't know if you know anything. Now, that can happen with old, worn-out brass fittings sometimes from water pressure. These were brand-new cartridge-type Water faucets, water, I mean, I guess that's what you call them, water faucets and hot and cold valves. Um, and I just turned around and I spoke to the to the, the air, I guess. I said, very funny, and walked out. Um, my assumption was that, you know, some soldier, sailor, somebody was playing a, uh, a joke on me. And... Um, Right next, uh, funny enough, right next to that bathroom is the USS Indianapolis display with original World War II radio equipment and uh, things inside. Uh, and I've spoken to the officers in there, and they said, uh, you hear very strange things in that place at night when no one's around. And uh, I, I don't doubt it. So those, those were my two police ghost stories no they're, they're great stories uh, i'm just on the topic of law enforcement for just one more question though mm -hmm, sure During that time because i know that we're reluctant to share our stories with, with our co-workers or fellow officers were there any other officers officers at that time that may have had experiences to share that share those stories with you yeah um I spoke to one officer. I, can't, I wish I, I, I probably have got it written down somewhere in, in, in one of my uh, books. Uh, but I spoke to another officer uh, who was uh, telling me about his personal experiences. I also have another friend who told me about his. And his was, this was, this would have been back in, uh, well, it would have been in probably in the mid to early 80s around that time. And uh, he's since long since retired too, um, but he and his partner were. It was either New York or, or or Michigan Street around Oriental Street. There was this house, and it was a, a two story house, and it was one of those old homes, the old part of of, of Indianapolis. And uh, there's a there's a bunch like that all around these neighborhoods. And this place happened to be broken up into two apartments uh, which is common and the there was a stairway from the outside leading up to the second floor apartment the main door of the house had been bolted and locked just permanently they used the, the, the downstairs people use a side entrance they are called the police and my buddy and his partner arrived the family were all huddled together and they were terrified. They were talking about <clears throat> noises coming from upstairs. They said they heard the front door, which was bolted and locked, open, slam shut, and bump, 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 bump up the steps to the second floor. Well, those steps were blocked off because it's, you know, it's two private residences now. When uh, the, my, bu my buddy and his partner 
I got done speaking to the family about what they'd heard and seen. They went upstairs, up those stairs outside to the second floor apartment and looked in. The only stick of furniture that was in there was a old piano bench. And the floor was covered with dust. The windowsill was covered with dead bugs and dust. But when they looked at the floor, they noticed that there were tracks in the dust where the piano bench had moved. I was just going to ask you that, too. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh, he wrote it. He wrote a book too. Uh, my, uh, but uh, it's uh, uh, it's it's uh, it's been so long now. I don't even not sure where it's at. I think my my middle son has it, but it was uh, it was some it was a paranormal uh, uh, martial arts kind of thing. But yeah, that uh, happened to him. Going back. We're going to talk about your YouTube channel and your investigations and the historical locations you visit. Have you gone back to those places since then and uh, either shot a video or try to see if uh, you can catch anything else? I've been to the Monroe House twice. My first visit to Monroe House was basically uh, we, we participated in the, in, in, in the investigation, but we didn't stay all night. I think we were there maybe five hours, six hours, something like that. Cause we, that, and that's in Hartford city, Indiana, which is my hometown. And, uh, and then we went back a second time uh, about a year ago and uh, didn't have anything happen uh, either time. Uh, I, what happened after we left the first time? I don't know. Uh, cat a corner from that is the Blackford County jail, the old Blackford County jail. Uh, it's a, a haunted location too, um, and I've been there once. We didn't really do an investigation; we did more of a tour, and this and the haunting stories around it. Um, I would like to go back there again. Um, there's also the Irvin Speakeasy. It used to be a furniture store, but above this store, it still says Irvin's. Above that is where the speakeasy was, and you can see that the there was a dance floor up there. Uh, it supposedly has activity too, and we've we've been to there. Uh, both both the people that run the uh, the uh, the Blackford County Jail and the um, the Urban Speakeasy have some other locations, and the 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 folks that run the uh, have the. Uh, uh, Monroe House, they're very nice. To, if if anybody's interested, they're they're very nice folks, uh, and they're very accommodating, and uh, and wonderful to work with. So if if you're if you're if you're in Indiana or thinking about going to either of those locations, uh, don't hesitate. There, there's uh, I think you'll 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 enjoy it and you'll be happy with those folks. I'm not sure whether I'm going to go back to Billy Creek or not, my, uh, I'm a 24 hour caregiver for my wife now. So that's uh, limited my uh, ability to, to search out places, but Billy Creek village, we went there. My son and I went to, uh, um, uh, Indiana state sanatorium. Um, and, um, we've been there twice, uh, daytime tours of the place and, and, and do a little bit of investigation on the second one uh, in the uh, residential building, which is both one of the most haunted buildings there. Uh, I don't know that I would, I'm not sure whether I would go back again. Maybe if I did, I would go to be specific places that I hadn't gone to because it's quite, it's a huge campus. And at my age, it's, uh, it's, that's a lot of walking. Uh, so it is, it makes for a tough day. Uh, so I may go back there a third time. We'll see. But Billy Creek, the second time we went there to uh, Indiana State Sanatorium, uh, Billy Creek Village is an amazing place. You got you got to see that too, and you can go there for free. It doesn't cost you anything to just go see it during the day. Uh, the owner the owner is fine with that. Now it costs to rent it for investigation at night, but you can go there during the day, and uh, I think you'll be uh, pretty pleased, pretty entertained by it. It's a very a lot of buildings. Um, 
we like to go there because uh, when I went uh, there the first time, I uh, had a brand new action camera, just learning how to work it, and thought I hit record. And instead, I turned it off. So, oh, no. so I got yeah. So I got nothing. Uh, so I would like to go back there. That's that's an amazing place. A lot of very old buildings. Uh, I don't know. Some of you may know the story. Uh, the guy uh, who started that started uh, building the place. I guess you wouldn't say building it, maybe making the place uh, back in the 60s. And he would take these old buildings, churches, schools, um, and old, you know, old buildings, even like there's even a log cabin there. Uh, he had them moved back in the 60s and literally turned this this plot of land into a village. There's even a, a town square that he created with a gazebo in the middle. So, uh, and you can find that on YouTube too. There's lots of people that, that have made videos there. And, uh, but I would, I would like to go back there. I'm supposed to uh, go there um, in the middle of April, I believe. And uh, so if I can find somebody to uh, take my uh, caregiver position just for, for a night, uh, I may do that uh, for an investigation there at Billy Creek uh, with uh, some uh, paranormal groups. With your experience with paranormal and while you were on patrol and the places you've gone to investigate and also making your YouTube videos, let's talk about your two books that you have currently out. How much of your experience and stories are put into these books? So if I'm going to pull up the titles of these books, I love, I love the titles of the book, Devil's Cabin, Hell Has No Pity, and then Dreams. Now, without giving any spoilers, how much of the information you just shared with us here on Let's Find Out went into telling the stories in these two books? The Devil's Cabin, I draw on a little bit, a few little odds and ends from my childhood in the town of Hartford City, uh, where I partially grew up in. I moved to Indianapolis in 1977, a few months before Elvis died. But uh, so I was, I was, uh, 16 when I moved to Indianapolis. Uh, I'm six, I'll be 64 this September. Uh, so I've been here most of my life, but I took some, some first names and some places and uh, the name of the town and put them into the story. But um, the woods that I had in my mind, I don't think I'm, if I, if I'm remember right last time i was back there i don't think they exist anymore i think it i think it became a housing addition or something but uh at one time they were deep dark woods according to uh you know uh, an eight-year-old boy and uh i was fascinated with it and and i re i remember that i remember climbing under and going over these big felled trees in the woods and things and it just seemed so mysterious to me and uh and so I, I, I envisioned that in the story, um, but uh, pretty much it's just all, all from the mind of, all from the mind of Asa Swift. Um, in dreams, that was, that was brought about because I wanted to see a movie that uh, about a famous horror author who's like Stephen King. And this is, this is what I thought. Wouldn't it be great if they made a movie about a guy like Stephen King who's written all these books and they take only the supernatural ones uh, and they, these characters that he's written about made up out of whole cloth in these books start ever so slightly appearing in his real life maybe a name comes up maybe a place that he made up actually now exists and then he starts catching glimpses of these characters and then he starts noticing other characters and they're they're doing things that uh he wrote about in his book and then they start actually becoming more and more in their in his face about it and then 
they start threatening him and his family and terrorizing all of them. And I thought, wouldn't it be great to make a movie like that? And as I, I thought to myself, as far as I know, no one has. And I thought, well, well that sucks. <laughs> I, maybe I should write the story myself if I want it. And so that's exactly what I did. And not only do you have the two books written, but you also have a series of short horror stories, and they're featured in three anthologies. What are the name? What are the titles of those stories? And which anthologies can they be found in? Uh, the first story is All Hallows Detour, and it's under the uh, the title of Under the Hallow Veil. And then the second one is uh, in the book uh, The Curse of the Hallow Moon, and that's. Uh, that's Idle Hands. That's the one that I wrote for that, that book. And the last one that I wrote for the anthology is called Whispers in the Hallow Night. And the story in there is Dead Weight, uh, because they do. Uh, I've written some other short stories, too, but I haven't published them. I'm got, I'll, I'll probably someday make my own anthology of all my short horror stories once those stories are, can legally be uh, put together in another book. And uh, I wrote Cabin on the Lake, which is pretty bizarre. Um, the Man Who Wasn't There is one that I just finished. And uh, I've got another, I'm looking at the manuscript now uh, that I just sent to the publisher after they've had it for a long time uh but the request that i made that i make some revisions and stuff and i and i looked through it and i agreed that <clears throat> yes it does it does need some more work and uh so uh i added quite a bit of words to that it's uh i'm but the, i don't write really long books i don't write like something like war and peace or uh, you know I, i'm no Ernest hemingway i just write fun scary stories and it's about uh just under sixty thousand words and it's called sycamore house and it's about a house in uh corridan indiana that uh was built by a, a rich shipping magnate for his wife whom he was uh absolutely madly in love with um and they had made a trip down down south and saw the plantation, beautiful plantations homes of the south in those days. This is just before the Civil War, and uh, wanted to build something like that for themselves in Indiana, even though this, you know, it wasn't a plantation state. And he and he wanted to build it uh, in court in Indiana, which is Indiana, Indiana's first capital, uh, and it's by by the Ohio River. Uh, uh, this is all all made up in my head but uh anyway it's it's uh, hopefully i'm we're hoping that it will be published uh in time for halloween but i make no guarantees they have you know of course they have a lot of other writers working for them too as well and then the last finished novel i've i've done is called the devil at saint john's and that's about a supposed little girl who does some very, very terrible things at, at a Catholic school and on uh, in a summer camp. Um, and it's, it's, it's along the lines of uh, The Exorcist. It's not for children, that's for sure. No, definitely The Exorcist is not for children at all. I don't even think no, it's for no. adults. <laughs> Yeah, this is the, the, these are these are these are these are uh, things in that in that story, the the devil at St. John's. That that's that's uh, the same t type of dialogue in uh, in The Exorcist when you have Linda Blair, you know, saying all the horrible things that I'm not going to sp not going to repeat on on the air. No, I get it. That's pretty shocking statements that uh, Linda Blair made, especially during that time. Um, I believe that movie, 
I, I think people were having health issues watching that movie back. That was what that was what was reported back then. Well, it was X rated back then. It was so bad, so scary that it was that it was X rated for a time. Yeah, you know, and I I think I seen it once, and once is good enough for me. Um, yeah. Even, even by today's standards, I think it still does hold up very well. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, uh, they they come out with a, another version. It was the the they really call it the version you've never seen, and it has some uh, uh, included footage. And one of them is with the scene they call. I don't know whether the the producers or the director called it that, but the, but it's been called the Spider Walk. And uh, when you see it, you'll know it, and it's shocking. It's made in the early seventies. And it's shocking. Yeah, no CGI, nothing like that. It was all no, stuff. no, it's a real thing. Everything that they did in there, that that really happened physically. You know, that they made it happen. But but yeah, everything they did in there physically happened. And in fact, uh, Linda Blair is paying for it to this day with back problems. Wow, pillow commitment is a great role that she played. And now we let's go and. In- into your YouTube channel, um, Ace of Swift's Haunted Places. I recently saw a video where you were at the Historic Spring Valley Cemetery, which was founded in 1824. Um, what other locations have you visited? And you've uploaded those videos on YouTube. Oh, my gosh. I've, uh, you mean other cemeteries or just other places? Oh, places or in some of your investigations oh, as well. I've, I've been to the uh, the Haunted Bridge up in uh, Noblesville. They call it the Haunted Bridge. It's a Holiday Road Bridge. I think it's painted orange now. Uh, but you uh, you access it through the through the through the long walk through this park up there. Uh, and if you, if you just look up Holiday Road Bridge, you'll see it. It's a beautiful walk. Uh, you you don't you want to take it just for the walk too. Uh, and it's very popular. Um, you know, the Beatles, there's a lot of a lot of folks there that that uh, that take that uh, path for jogging and and just walking and exercise. Very scenic. So if you're not even if you're not in the haunted places, uh, that's still a place to to go and check out. Um, of course, I did the the, the war memorial as I said, and uh, which I'm also uh, fascinated with World War II. But uh, so that's that's why I, I I wanted to go there. That was the impetus for it. I'm trying to think of of uh, of places I went to. I've, the uh, there were some other um, pioneer cemeteries. I've been quite a few of the pioneer cemeteries in Marion County, which is the county Indianapolis is in, and tiny little places. Some of them are in people's backyard. Uh, ancient graves from people born in the 1700s. Uh, I just I I find that fascinating. Um, one of the big ones in town is uh, Crown Hill Cemetery, and of course, if, if, if for people like us, we know that that's where John Dillinger is buried. <clears throat> but that's also where a mass grave of uh, orphaned children are located too, as well. And uh, you'll see the uh, in my in a video on that. The uh, I think I've done a done a couple of them on on that particular site. The uh, the monument they have there, and to and to the, all the children are named, and all the various orphanages are named. Uh, in fact, the Booth brothers did uh, a portion on that in their documentary, Children of the Gray. That's another something else to take a look at if you if uh, you want to find out more about. Them. The Indianapolis uh, orphan children in the mass grave at Crown Hill Cemetery. Uh, I went to one of my my very one of my very first videos was um, at a place called Gaslight Inn. It's no longer uh, open, um, but that was one of John Dillinger's hangouts, and it's on uh, uh, South Meridian Street, Old Meridian Street, and uh, the building is still there. Uh, I think right right now it's up in limbo. I haven't been there and, and heard any more about it, but <clears throat> it's the old Gaslight Inn, and uh, uh, I think there's a few videos on it as well. Um, the Slippery Noodle Inn, that's a that's another famous place. That is the Indiana's longest continuous uh, open bar. 
uh, and it was also a, a brothel back in the day. And sometimes you can get them to take you on tours of the place, as as I and my uh, cameraman slash middle son uh, did. And uh, they'll take you upstairs, and there are these little rooms. And, well, you know, what do you need them for? 15 yeah. minutes? Uh, that's the <laughs> yeah. kind. That's that's all they that's all they are. And uh, it's, it's fascinating. And there's just a whole row of them. Uh, there's... Uh, Part of there is uh, in the brickwork are bullets and uh, shotgun pellets fired into the mortar and bricks from back in its uh, rowdy 1920s, 30s days. Uh, Dillinger is supposed to have uh, hung out there at one time, too, when the place was named something different. I think I don't know if it was first named this or when it had this name, but it was originally called the Tremont House at one point before it was a slippery noodle in. Uh, and that that sign was was repainted on the brickwork by the by the uh, owner who has passed uh, before he, he he did some uh, work in there to restore one of the one of the brothel rooms. Uh, he did some work in the basement uh, where they had a still at one time. Uh, so uh, there's also a portion of it where they used to stable horses back in the day and uh, sto- uh, a hay loft. Uh, so it was a very interesting place. Prices are reasonable. Uh, they, they got good food. It's a, and I, I, part of the reason that I know about it is because so, that's a cop hang out. <laughs> it still is to this day. <laughs> now, with all the locations that you visited so far and filmed for your YouTube channel, which one sticks out the most to you? Which did I like the most? Yes. Oh, man. I think I was, I think so far, I think so far I've been mostly fascinated with the old Blackford County Jail and, uh, and well, of course, the, the, the Pioneer Cemetery fascinate me too. The things having to do with history. Uh, I, you know, I, and you'll hear me talk about it too, uh, going to the Pioneer Cemetery about how these people's lives were back then and, uh, how hard they were and everything required manual, hard labor. And I, I made the comment in my last video, uh, that's why when you look through these historical photos from you know, back in the Civil War days and and around that time, you won't see any fat people <laughs> because just to eat took very hard work. Uh, and so, you know, their and their lives were short. I mean, can you imagine? I mean, there's so many graves in these pioneer cemeteries. Look at the dates on them: infant, infant, uh, one year, six months. Uh, one one was a, a a wife of somebody, and she was she was either twenty three or twenty six years old. Uh, my God, you know, you you just get married, and you and you have, you have this beautiful wife that you love just more than anything, and she's taken from you at twenty six after after all the hard labor and and sacrifice that you've done throughout your life to only have that happen, and then losing your children too. So it was just, uh, we would consider that, consider their lives a nightmare. Yes. So, you know, the history of the thing fascinates me. And if you know anything about history, you know that it's full of ghosts. A hundred percent true. And visiting a lot of these locations, especially the cemeteries, um, what are the conditions? Who's up keeping the cemeteries? Because I mean, something that's hundreds of years old. I think down the line, eventually, they they lose the um, either the funding or maybe the families don't take care of it anymore. Some of them are uh, family cemeteries, but uh, uh, the Washington Township, the Washington Township, well, not Washington, but the the townships in Marion County are responsible for maintaining these old pioneer graves. 
regardless of where they are. Uh, now there's some, there's one that I went to that had maybe, I don't know, four graves maybe. It's in a housing addition back in the woods. And uh, it was it was definitely not maintained. But again, at one point it, it would have been because there, with this tiny little Pioneer Cemetery were uh, galvanized pieces of metal and chicken wire and little pieces of, of remnants of, of buildings that used to be back there. And so I'm, I'm assuming that this, this was, of course, would have been on a farm or, or near a farm, which is another thing too. Wouldn't it be great if you could see a before and after or then and now type photos? Would it look like then and compare it to now? Yeah, those photos would be amazing to see if they have that type of technology back then. Or even if they did it, could they afford it? So for the listeners of Let's Find Out that want to learn more about your books and your YouTube channel, where can they find this information? They can go to aceofswift.com, uh, and they can learn about my books there. Uh, if they want to learn about me, they can go to uh, uh, YouTube or Rumble. All of my videos on YouTube, again, because they're they're – they're 4K and they're very large files. Rumble can't take the largest, the big, large 4K files right now. I'm hoping someday they can. Uh, but you look up Asa Swift, type in Asa Swift's Haunted Places, or just Asa Swift. It'll come up. Thank you for that. And if you happen down the line to um, release a new book or have any more experiences, um, if you don't mind coming back on the show and telling us us – no, I, I don't mind that. Uh, I'm uh, I'm hoping to uh, put together a little uh, I don't know, a little little ad uh, showing the, uh, the the new book cover for Sycamore House, kind of as a teaser for when it comes out when it's uh, published. Excellent, my friend. We're looking forward to that one. This has been another excellent episode of Let's Find Out with Diego. Please check us out on all our social media pages, YouTube, and we're also on Rumble. Like, share, and subscribe. Also, Let's Find Out is now on KGRA Digital Broadcasting. Catch the show on Saturdays at 2 a.m. For more information, please visit KGRADB.com. That's KGRADB.com. Thank you for taking this journey with me. Until next time, my friends. Copyright co-host Diego, all content for Let's Find Out, is the property of co-host Diego, and is served directly from our servers with no modification, redirects, or rehosting. All celebrity impersonators are paid performers. The impersonated celebrities do not endorse or promote any views or opinions expressed by our guests, co-host Diego, or Let's Find Out. The information shared on Let's Find Out is provided on an as-is basis with no guarantees of completeness, accuracy, usefulness, or timeliness.